All right, buenos dias, mis amigos. All right, the first thing I want to go over today is something interesting that I learned this week. And that is in Psalm 103, uh, verse 5. Uh, it says, Who satisfies thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles? Now, what's interesting is that the eagle will shed its feathers and grow new feathers. And now, for an eagle to leave and rip out its feathers and have them grow back in a painful way, no. Every single year, eagles lose all of their feathers and they grow in a new set. Now, it's a couple. All right, all right, so anyway, I didn't know that. That's interesting. They're renewed. Thy youth is renewed like the eagles. To me, it's just very interesting. Okay. Now, I'm just going to roll through the first two and then put a little more focus on Jerry Falwell. So, um, I want to share with you what this young fella has to say. Someone as young as three can comprehend the gospel and believe it and be saved. So, yeah, teach your kids the gospel. All right, Noah's asked, Hey, Ryan, my boss said something interesting today. He told me the only true word of God is the KJV. That makes no sense, obviously, but how would you respond to this? I would say this, check it with the Bible, yo. Check it with the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible does it. Check it with the Bible, yo. Check it with the Bible, yo. Would ever say the KJV English translation is the only true Bible. Think about it just logically for a moment. So the KJV is never mentioned anywhere in the Bible. Never. Is that that? <laughs> um. What's that matter? Acronym KJV or King James Version. King James is never even mentioned in the Bible. Why? Because he lived 1,600 years after the time of... Okay, hold on. All right, so this this is completely irrelevant, and you're trying to set up a straw man. It, to me, it, it feels like you're trying to go somewhere with it, and, and you're not going to go anywhere with that. All right. You're just uh, putting out false assertions, and... <laughs> has no relevance at all. Jesus, and after the Bible is completed. So then, yeah, wh what would I say? I'd say this. What? Uh, yeah, I don't know what you're saying either, man. Honest to God. I no idea what the point was that you're making. To me, that's a young man has no idea how to answer this. All right, and this is one of these things that you should be ready for an answer. If a young fella comes to you that's either not a believer or a young believer, and they ask you, is the Bible perfect? If Is your God perfect? If your God is perfect, you ought to have a perfect Bible. Especially considering the Bible itself says that every word is perfect here and I mean all right so I was gonna go through a few verses it also says that man cannot live by bread alone but by every word of God all right and, and what's the Bible say yo what's the Bible say yo Jesus answered saying it is written it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Now, begs the question, where can I find every word of God? If we can't live by bread alone, but by every word of God, then it's important that we have every word 
of God. What language was the Bible originally written in? What's that matter? I mean, do you know what the Bible says? I mean, what's the Bible say, yo? What's the Bible say, yo? Let's just do it this way. <laughs> what's the Bible say, yo? And how hear we, every man, in our own tongue, wherein we were born? How is that possible? Do you, to me, it's, has nobody read this? Has anybody read the Bible? I mean, all these people that are against the idea of a perfect Bible, have you not read the Bible? You certainly haven't believed what you read. That's pretty clear. The first Corinthians 14, verse 21. Think about this. In the law, it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. Other tongues, other lips, this is talking about other languages. Anytime the Bible talks about tongues, it's talking about languages. Make no mistake about that. Make no mistake about that. All right here we got a description of uh, in Genesis 10 when, when the people were um, divided, if you will, into nations and um, when God confounded the language, each, each uh, group of people were put in their own land with their own tongue and it gives a list of all these um, groups of people if you will these nations and countries however you want to describe it and before all that before God confounded the language the whole earth was of one language and of one speech tongues languages same thing make no mistake about that I mean it's pretty simple but um, a lot of people out there that don't get it all right in the law it is written with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people and yet for all that will they not hear me saith the Lord anytime somebody goes to a foreign language what they're saying or what they're implying is that you can't trust the Word of God in the English language. We've got to go and depend on what the serpent says. If you think about Genesis 3, when the serpent um, was talking to Eve, right and you know you think about when God what God told Eve and then here comes the serpent getting Eve to doubt what God has said the very first verse now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made and he said unto the woman yea as God said question mark Yea, as God said in, in English, let's go see what the Hebrew says, or let's go see what the Greek says, or the Aramaic, or the Chinese, or whatever. It doesn't matter to me, because I don't know any of those languages. And you're basically saying, I can't trust the Word of God at all. I have to learn five or six different languages to know what God says. I barely know one language. Barely. <laughs> you know, it's unbelievable that somebody wouldn't take that stand. That just says, hey, you can't trust the English. You can't. 
can't trust the Bible that you hold in your hands. That's what he's saying. I don't know why he's not being straightforward. I think it's out of shame and doubt, insecurity, and ignorance. And uh, it's a lack of honesty. It really is. Just come right out and say, you guys can't trust the Bible that you hold in your hands. You'll never hear him say that. I've I've never heard him. I've been doing, looking at this for quite a few years now, and I've never heard anybody say, you can't trust the Bible that you hold in your hands. But the, the arguments they make is suggesting that you can't trust the Bible you hold in your hands. It's incredible. I was only going to spend a minute on this, but you, you take 2 Corinthians 2, verse 17, and you look at other translations. Let's first of all, in the King James it says, For we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God. Right? We are not as many which corrupt the Word of God. For we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God. But as of sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Obviously, the corrupting of the Word of God is <laughs> goes all the way back to Genesis 3. And it will continue until the end of the world. That's just simple stuff, really. But let's go to the ESV. For we are not, like so many, peddlers of God's word. They completely changed the meaning of that verse. And not only do they change it from corrupting the word of God to selling, peddling the word of God, it's a completely different meaning. But what they change it to is exactly what they do. They peddle their Bible versions so that they can make money. And it's, it's interesting because they have to change a certain amount of the words in order to abide by copyright laws. That's why they have so many changes. Now... Let's go to Oh. Huh, that's weird. ESV doesn't have Matthew 18 verse 11. That's weird, isn't it? Well, that is very weird. Why doesn't the ESV have verse 11? What does verse 11 say? For the Son of Man has come to save that which is or was lost. The ESV, they, why would they omit that? Well, that's weird, isn't it? Well, they claim that they're basing their translation off of certain manuscripts now if you knew that then you should also know that the manuscripts they claim to base their translation off of are Vatican manuscripts the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus um, that's interesting why would they do that why would they omit the Word of God. And it's not just that, but a, even a child knows how to count beyond 10. All right? So you go, you see here very clearly on the left hand side 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. No problems. Here, you gotta search, okay? So that 18 signifies 1, 2, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 
no 11, 12. That's stupid. It really is very, very stupid. Because there's an 11 in between 10 and 12. Very obvious that you've omitted 11. Why, if you're... <laughs> Why not go 10, 11 here? Make this one 11. If you're so confident that that verse shouldn't be there, then why not just go 10, 11, 12? It's because they're deliberately, willfully corrupting the Word of God. Okay. It's mind-bogglingly stupid, in my opinion. Okay. Has he got anything else to say here? Hebrew, Greek, and small parts of Aramaic. So the Bible was not originally written in English. It, well, the Bible was not originally written in Aramaic, in Greek, and we could dispute if it was even originally written in Hebrew but uh, wow huh let me think let me uh, let me show you something here let me show you something that's kind of interesting here uh, here in verse 23. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 23, and Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. This was not spoken in Hebrew. This is translated from the original. I mean, that's pretty obvious. Should be obvious. Because at the time Adam spoke that, there was only one language in the whole world. There was only one language for a long time. And so when he spoke that, he was not talking Hebrew guarantee it. He was not talking any language that anybody could understand today. Now, where does the Word of God come from? This idea here is stupid. That the Word of God comes from a dead language? That's a stupid, stupid idea. It's a stupid teaching. You shouldn't be teaching it. You should not be teaching that at all. That, that, that's something that, that the Muslims teach. The Muslims, they'll teach that you have to know Arabic to know what the word of Allah really says. And this gentleman and so many others like him are applying that same logic, which is illogical, to the Bible. It's stupid. Now the word of God comes from heaven. You should know that. This is simple stuff. Forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. The word of God comes from above, not from dead languages. All right, and then what? In the resurrection. When at the end of the world, when we are regenerated or resurrected, when we are changed from corruptible to incorruptible, when we go from mortal to immortal, and there's a new heaven and a new earth, do you think we're going to start to speak Hebrew, and Greek, and Aramaic? No. Now, that's stupid. I, I just wonder, do people even put any thought into this? 
For then, okay, so Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 9. For then, in the resurrection, I will turn to the people a pure language, that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one con with one consent. It couldn't be more obvious. The word of God comes from above. You think about Moses. And he went up into the mountain. And God gave him tables of stone written with the finger of God. The word of God came directly from the, the Bible, if you will. The, the Ten Commandments came directly from God, written with the finger of God. Two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. The Word of God comes directly from God. Now, this, these tables of testimony, the... The words, they don't originate from the tablet. They don't originate from the, t the tables. They originate from God above. It's always been the case. <laughs> and this is simple stuff, but I think it has to be established in your mind in order to get it. The Word of God does not... originate from the tables of stone. The, origin, the, the Word of God originates from God above. And then, of course, what happened to those... Um, oh, what's that verse? To those tables... Um, oh, goodness. What verse was that? Oh, that's what it was. Okay, so... Um, I want to go before that. I'm not sure. I forget what the exact phrasing here. There, Moses anger waxed hot because when he came down, I mean, he must have been just um, full of joy, and then he comes down and he sees all the people worshiping the calf. And so his anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hand and break them beneath the mount. All right, so he smashed the Ten Commandments, smashed them. All right, so let's go to this one right here. such 
as the world has never known. And then the Battle of Armageddon, we spoke on that. And when the forces of the earth will do war against God and the blood shall flow in the streets up to the bridles of the horses for 200 miles, that will occur simultaneous with the revelation of Christ in power and in great glory, coming the second time with his church. Remember, he came at the beginning of the tribulation for his church, now coming with his church. And some 75 days later, sitting down upon the throne of David in Jerusalem, and then after the judgment of the nations, the millennial reign of Christ, when Christ will rule on this earth for 1,000 years. After which, at the end of which, Satan, who was bound in the early part of the millennium, will be loosed for a season, one final battle, then the great white throne judgment when the unredeemed will be judged and damned, the earth cleansed by fire. You know the rest of the story, eternity, where John said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, I read to you from Isaiah 11 what it's going to be like during the 1,000-year reign of grace on this.